So hi everyone, welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Katherine Longmire and I am going to moderate today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Office of Education along with the National Sea Grant College Program where I work and is supported by Woods Hole Sea Grant and NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we welcome Malia Evans at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and Papa Namakuakea Marine National Monument, who will talk with, us, talk with us about native Hawaiian oral traditions and ancestral connection, connections with the coral polyp. If you've been following NOAA Live, you'll know she talked with us last year about how Native Hawaiians shared ecological and cultural observations and knowledge across time and space. She was a popular speaker and we're so happy to have her back. This year, she has a 10 minute hands-on activity during her talk and we hope you were able to find the list of materials you'll need in advance. If you didn't get a chance, this webinar is recorded so you can do the activity at a later, later date. Before we start, we would like to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional knowledge to share with us. We acknowledge Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are today identified as Native Hawaiians. We also acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Pamunkey and Chickahominy tribes. I also want to extend a special thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters, Crystal Butler, and Jillian Traumer. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Malia, you're all muted. However, there's a chat box where you can write questions and we encourage you to do that as we go along. If we don't get to your question, no worries. We've given you some resources so you can look things up after the webinar. Also, Malia has generously agreed to answer questions we don't get to and we will post the answers along with the recording of today's webinar on our website. Finally, Malia is going to have some questions for you throughout the webinar, so get ready to type. All right, I'm set, so I'll turn it over to Malia. Take it away. Aloha to all of you and haoli makahiki ho. Happy New Year and welcome to all of you joining in today. So my name is Malia Kapua Ondalani Evans and I was born and raised right here in Hawaii. I am um, one of 11, I'm one, I'm number 11 of 12 children, if you can believe that. I have 12 children in my family, and um, here I am in this photo with my tutu man, who is a very famous waterman and canoe paddling coach. If you look at this picture here, this is a part of my family. I, by the time I came along, my mom and dad were not taking family photos. Can you imagine being 12 children in a family? It's pretty crazy, right? But I have been a hula dancer since I was four years old. And you can see that in this top picture here. And I've been really fortunate to train with many esteemed kumu hula or hula teachers throughout the years. I descend from a line of traditional hula and cultural practitioners and Hawaiian language newspaper editors who documented Hawaiian history, Hawaiian oral traditions, including the stories, the songs, and the chants where an abundance of traditional ecological knowledge and Hawaiian values and beliefs have been passed down from generation to generation. That passing of knowledge continues with my granddaughter, who you can see here. She's dancing hula, she's passed, she's carrying on that hula lineage, and she's dancing in front of Iolani Palace. I went to college after I had my five children, and I got my bachelor's and master's degree in archaeology and historic preservation so that I could advocate and help to protect the Hawaiian cultural sites and share our stories. So I work as an education and Native Hawaiian outreach specialist for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. From this map that you see, you can see all the different places that NOAA helps to protect. 
so that we and our families and all of those who come after us will have a chance to visit and learn about these spectacular places. There are three protected areas in the Pacific region under the sanctuary system. And you can see them here on the map, the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, and the place that I work on behalf, Papa Hanau Mokua Kea Marine National Monument. So Papa Hanau Mokua Kea encompasses over 580,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean an area larger than the Gulf of Mexico, and it's one of the largest marine conservation areas in the world. Papa Hanaumokuakea is considered the ancestral homeland of the Hawaiian people and is internationally recognized as a UNESCO cultural and natural world heritage site. So today, I am joining all of you from Waianae, which is located on the west side of the island of Oahu. And you can see that circle right there. You see how long our archipelago stretches out, yeah? So we're in the middle of Moananuia Kea, the Polynesian name for the Pacific Ocean. Honolulu is the capital city of Hawaii, and it's located on the south side of Oahu. The Hawaiian archipelago stretches over 1,500 miles from the youngest islands in the southeast to the oldest islands in the northwest. These older islands and atolls are called the Kupuna Islands, the elder or ancestral islands where life originates and spirits return after death. The oldest island, now an atoll, Holaniku, was born about 28 million years ago over the same hot spot that's currently building up Hawaii Island. These elder islands and atolls and the surrounding waters, which make up Papahanaumokuakea, are a spectacular place with extensive coral reefs, sacred native Hawaiian sites, important archeological and maritime heritage sites, and abundant life forms on land and in the ocean. It is also a training ground for ancient and modern wayfinders and voyagers. If you look at that dotted white line, that highlights the area that are protected within the monument. So if you noticed, I mentioned about the Hawaiian Islands being born. Nearly every culture in the world has a creation story that explains how the world be began and how humans came to live there. It is in our human nature to wonder about the mysteries around us and to search for answers. These cosmogonies or theories on how the universe was created influence the way we think about the world and our place in it. Do any of you know creation stories from your own cultural background or from the place where you live? All origin stories should be respected as they relate to people's cultural values and belief systems. So today, we are going to focus on the coral polyp, a creation story from Hawaii. So early Hawaiians composed and transmitted their oral traditions through memorization, not through writing. They composed and maintained an extensive body of literature covering every facet of Hawaiian life. Chants, called mele, recorded thousands of years of ancient Polynesian and Hawaiian history. The chants documented the daily life of the people, their love of the land, historical events, genealogies, and legends, among many things. A mele, or a chant, is a poetic form of song that tells a story. So the story that you're going to be listening to is one of our most well-known creation stories, the Kumulipo, meaning origin or the source of life. In the Kumulipo, the birth of the coral polyp was the beginnings of life and is our most ancient ancestor to all living things, including us humans. 
early Hawaiians acknowledged that coral reefs were the basic building blocks in the ocean and often used coral in ceremonial rituals and medicine. So after the birth of the coral polyp, numerous other life forms are born in the ocean, on land, they're evolving in complexity. And what's really, really interesting is that humans are born halfway through the story after all of the other life forms. Hmm. So humans are really the younger siblings to the natural world all around us. So I want you to close your eyes. I'm going to pull up the chat right now. Close your eyes. Open your ears and listen very carefully to this Hawaiian perspective on the birth of the universe and the birth of the coral polyp. So here we go, closing your eyes. Okay, let's try that again. Let me turn on that speaker so you guys can hear it, yeah? Let's try that one again. Pretty amazing. So do you guys know that what you just heard was just a tiny little portion of the 2000 line chant, which can take four to five hours to recite the entire Kumulipo. So to me, that's pretty amazing because remember when I said that Hawaiians memorized, right? They didn't write it. Hawaiians, early Hawaiians didn't have books. They didn't have computers. They didn't have videos. They didn't have cell phones or TikTok. So all the knowledge had to be memorized and passed down through hundreds of years, including the Kumulipo. So Hanauka uku koa koa, Hanaukana he a koa koa puka. Born the coral polyp, born of him, a coral colony emerged. So, who wants to learn more about this ancient ancestor to the Hawaiian people? I do. But before we continue our journey, let's see if there are any questions, Kathy. Yes, please. If you have any questions at this point, um, feel free to uh, to type in your question. We'd love to hear you guys. And while we're waiting, I'd also love to say a very special shout out to Mr. Zavala's third grade class because the students are so excited. So welcome. We have a question. Lori asks, how do you say coral polyp in Hawaiian? Good question, Lori. So a coral polyp is called an uku. Koa koa. I'm gonna say it again so you can you can follow up to me. Uku koa koa. Uku koa koa. That's a coral polyp. Thanks for your question. So keep practicing. It'll come, it'll come easier the more that you practice. Yes, absolutely. And we have another question. Um, did the first coral polyp have a name? What a great question. And you know what? I do not see it in the Kumulipo that it had a specific name. So they were more, it was more of a generic naming process. So coral polyps were called uku koa koa, corals were called puna. So I don't think it had a specific name like we have specific names. It was more of a generalization. Great question. 
I'm sorry, that was from Rachel, apologies. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so we have some questions. We have one that's how are corals created, but you know what, we'll actually get to that. Um, so let's see. We have we have one good question here. What is your favorite type of coral? Laura Laura asks. My favorite type of coral, you know, I really don't have a favorite because they're all so important. They're so important, the reef building corals, the encrusting corals. Um, there's just so many different kind of corals here in Hawaii. I think we have like over 70 different species of corals. And so it's hard for me to have a favorite. I love all of them because they're so important and they, they are just um, amazing, amazing organisms. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Let's dive into the next part of your, of your webinar. Thank you. All right, so friends, are we ready to go on a journey? So we just heard a small portion of the chant which describes the birth of the Hawaiian people's first ancestor, the coral polyp. So let me see, raise your hand. I can't really see you folks, but just go ahead. Raise your hand if you have ever seen a coral reef. And where do we find coral? Put it in the chat. Where do we find coral? Where do we find coral? That's a great question. Pula says in the ocean. Theodore says coral reefs. Lori says near shore. Uh, David says ocean. And Sean says in tropical warm aquatic climates. Nice. Follow Lay. You folks are correct, right? The ocean is where our corals are growing. So we're gonna go on a journey to learn more about the coral polyp. Are you folks ready? In order to get there, we are going to have to paddle our canoe so that we can get out to where the coral reefs are in the ocean, right? So I want all of you to pretend that you have a paddle in your hand. And here in Hawaii, we have a different way of paddling, yeah, than maybe some of the other where places that have canoes. But we're gonna paddle, we're gonna hold our paddle in our two hands, and we're gonna stroke from top to bottom. We're gonna stroke from top to bottom. So we all need to work together and paddle that canoe all the way out to the coral reef. So I'm gonna sing a song. And while I'm singing, I want you all to paddle your canoe. And when I come to the part that says no ka best, I want you all to throw me a shaka. Okay, so a shaka, that's a shaka. You guys, can you see that? So at the no ka best, we're gonna throw a shaka. So are we ready to paddle our canoes? I'm gonna get my ukulele. And we are going to paddle. Are you all ready? Makoko. Okay, off we go. Get those paddles ready to go. Here we go. One paddle, two paddle, three paddle. Leave your phone at home. Fourteen on the right, fourteen on the left. Take me to the coral reef. Okay, Shaka, no ka best. Again. One paddle, two paddle. Three paddle, leave your phone at home. Fourteen on the right, fourteen on the left. Now take me to the coral reef. Throw your shaka, no ka best. One more time. One paddle, two paddle, three paddle, leave your phone at home. Fourteen on the right, fourteen on the left. Take me to the coral reef. Look the best. All right. So we have arrived. So place your pad paddles in the bottom of the va'a, in the bottom of the canoe. And let's put on our gear. We are going to get ready to dive into this beautiful coral reef ecosystem. Let me see you folks. Put on your fins. Come on, get your fins on. Let's get them on our feet. Put your fins on. Okay, what else do we need? What else do we need? We need our mask, yes. And we need our snorkel. 
And do you see this picture right here? This is President Barack Obama, who was out in Papahanaumokuakea, out snorkeling over the beautiful coral reef. Look at all those colors. So are you ready? Let's jump in. Get in that beautiful water so we can take a deeper dive and closer look at coral polyps. So coral reefs are like the rainforests of the ocean. Similar to the rainforests, they are some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Look at all of those different colors of the coral. Oh, and look, look at all those fish and the marine algae. Can any of you identify some of those fish? You can write it in the chat if you know what some of those fish are. Hi. Hi. Lots of different fish. Go ahead and write it in the chat. We have some angelfish. Yeah. Cynthia, Cynthia and Alice say angelfish and Theodore. Sandra says squirrel fish and Moorish idol. Moorish idols. Good job. Laura says zebra fish and uh, she also says tang and Lauren says coal. Uh, Cole. Yes, good job. Cole. I actually don't know my fish. So <laughs> you all are, are naming more fish than I could do. And Danye, or Danielle says uh, manpachi fish. Manpachi. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, you folks are so good at knowing your fish. Great job. So that's what we'll see on a healthy coral reef ecosystem, right? all these different species of aquatic plants and animals, and they rely on a healthy coral reef for their survival. Oh, I spy a Hawaiian green sea turtle or honu. And our honu, they love to eat the limu or the marine algae that grows on the, cor on the coral. So the Hawaiian word, the generic kind of basic word for coral is puna. And these threatened native turtles depend on a healthy coral reef for survival. Oh, do you see what I see? I see two ula, or Hawaiian spiny lobster. Coral reefs are important to thousands of communities throughout the world and in Hawaii that depend on them for food, coastal protection, and jobs. Oh, let's swim very slowly, very quietly past this moray eel, hiding among the low coral, because we do not want to disturb it. He poi na kai uli, kai ko'o, a ohehi na pū ko'a. Though the sea be deep, Though the sea be deep and rough, the coral rock remains standing. This olelo noeau, or traditional Hawaiian proverb, contains traditional ecological knowledge. Coral reefs are natural barriers that protect the shoreline from wave action and storms, helping to prevent loss of life, property damage, and erosion. When reefs are damaged or destroyed, the absence of this natural barrier can increase the damage to coastal communities like where I live in Waianae from normal wave action and violent storms. In Hawaiian culture, coral is a symbol of resiliency and strength in the face of adversity. So I have a question for you. Are corals rocks, plants, or animals? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat. What do you think? Rocks, plants, or animals? Well, this is a smart crowd. Uh, everyone's saying animals. <laughs> oh, you guys are so smart. Kira, Lisa, Pua, uh, Sean, everybody, everybody, Janet, Omar, Theodore, everybody says animals. 
Oh, you guys are on it. Akamai Loa. So smart. So you know what? Sometimes people do not. There's other people that don't know that these are animals. Because with their hard surfaces, corals are sometimes mistaken for rocks. And because they are attached or rooted to the seafloor, they are often mistaken for plants. However, like you all know, corals are really living animals, right? I have a coral that washed up on the beach, yeah? So coral has a rock-like shell that's made out of limestone. And this skeleton protects the soft, delicate body of the polyp. Virtually all corals are community or colonial organisms, meaning that they are made up of several hundreds of thousands of individual animals called polyps. They're kind of like ohana, yeah, like family. They share connective tissue, they share food, they share space, and like we know, sharing is caring, right? Even after a polyp has died, the shell remains and forms the foundation for another polyp to build a house on. So they kind of like apartment buildings in the ocean. So as you can see in this photo, you see all those little tiny coral polyps. They look like little flowers. They are so beautiful. So thousands and thousands in a piece of coral like I showed you, right? See that? Thousands and thousands of coral polyps lived in this coral skeleton. So coral polyps can range in size from tiny, tiny animals that you can only see with a microscope or goggles up to larger polyps that can be a foot in diameter. So I have a question that I always think about. How did my ancestors know about these tiny microscopic animals that are the foundation of life in the ocean when they didn't have microscopes? They didn't have goggles, right? But what they did have was keen observation over hundreds of years with this, our oldest ancestor, the coral polyp. So unlike plants, corals do not make their own food. Corals are predators and each polyp has a stomach that opens at one end, right there. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here's our stomach and here's where that opening is, yeah? This opening, the mouth, is surrounded by a circle of stinging, stinging tentacles. The polyp uses these tentacles to move debris away, to defend itself, and to capture food. But what do coral polyps eat? And when do they eat? So I want you all to pretend with me. We are gonna pretend that we are coral polyps, all right? So everybody, I want you to get down into your, into your skeleton. And we're hiding in our skeleton shell during the day. Oh, but as soon as the sun goes down, we start to emerge. Let me see you starting to emerge from your hard shell skeleton. And here come your tentacles with their stinging cells coming out and they start to move in the ocean current and they're moving. And oh, here comes a group of plankton drifting by. So I want you to take your stinging tentacles and grab some of that plankton and bring that plankton down into your mouth and down into your stomach. After that food is digested in the stomach, waste products are created, and guess what? They exit through the same opening. And that's a lot of hard work for the tiny coral polyp that can't move its rock-like shell, right? Because it's stuck and has to depend on capturing floating plankton to eat. So something cool is going on. Coral polyps have developed a special friendship. It's kind of like a BFF. Do any of you have a BFF? 
a best friends forever? I know I do. Well, coral polyps have BFFs that are actually tiny ocean plants that help them to survive. This relationship between the coral polyp and the tiny ocean plant is called a symbiotic relationship. So repeat after me, symbiotic. Symbiotic. Symbiotic means a close beneficial relationship between two different living organisms. This tiny ocean plant or alga is called zooxanthellae. Can you repeat that after me? Zoo, zan, feli. Let's put it together. Zooxanthellae. And you can pronounce it zooxanthellae or zooxanthellae. Either way is correct. So the coral polyp actually invites the zooxanthellae into its body, and the zooxanthellae becomes the coral's main energy source. Okay, so here's another question for you all. Where do plants get their energy from? Put it in the chat. So we kind of know. I think you guys are all so smart. You all know about this, right? I'm going to do a little hula move. Yeah. What's up there, right? Theodore What's says the sun. We have someone who says sun, air, and water. Lisa says sun. Lauren says photosynthesis. Lauren and Alice say photosynthesis. Yep. And a lot of people say the sun. Janet, Sharon, Rachel. Yep. Good That's job. If you, if you said the sun, you are so correct, right? Because the zooxanthellae, just like a tree or other plant, it gets energy from the sun and makes it into food. Since a coral polyp is giving the zooxanthellae a place to live and to be protected, the zooxanthellae gives almost all of its sun food in the form of photosynthesis to the coral polyp. So they both benefit. BFFs, best friends forever. You guys are so smart. You know all about photosynthesis and how these Different plants depend on the sun to get their energy. So, so far, what we have learned about the coral polyp is that we know that the coral polyp, the uku ko'a ko'a, is the oldest ancestor of the native Hawaiian people. We also know that they have a hard shell-like skeleton that's firmly attached to the seafloor or to the coral below it. We know that they have stinging tentacles and that's how they capture some of their food. We also know they have BFFs or symbiotic relationship with the zooxanthellae, yes? And we know that they are living in ohana or family groups called colonies. So much things that we have learned from our short time together. So we still have our activity where we're going to make a coral polyp together. If you folks have the uh, supplies and if you don't, that's okay too. You can always do this later because I know that this is being recorded. But before we go into our hands-on activity, do we have any questions, Kathy? Oh my gosh, we have so many questions. Um, I think I'm going to limit it to one, though, and I wanted to go back to the um, origin story, and Victoria had asked a great question. Are there any other creation stories from around the world that have simil similarities to the coral polyp, like how the Great Flood is told across Mesopotamia? That is a wonderful question, Victoria. You know, I'm not very familiar with other indigenous peoples or other cultural um, creation stories. Um, I know that here in Hawaii, we have not just the Kumulipo, but we have other creation stories as well, which are genealogies. 
Um, but that would be a wonderful research project. Yes. For you to do a kind of comparison. You could do a comparison and look at different um, cultures and see whether there are similarities. Um, a wonderful resource that you could check out is Joseph Campbell. He's done a lot of work um, in looking at different um, stories from different cultures and, and comparing them and kind of finding out certain um, things that are similar between all the different stories. So that would be a great research project. I'd love to hear more about it as you get more information. Thank you so much for that resource. We'll definitely look into that. All right, let's jump into our activity. All right, so I am gonna come out of presenter mode so that we can do our project together. Let me just, let me see how I can, okay, stop showing screen. And I think we're good, yes? Okay, all right, my friends. Let's see if you have got your supplies. We had asked that everybody have these supplies. So we're going to need a base, right? And you can use whatever you want. You, you can use cardboard, you can use a cereal box, you can use an Amazon box. I'm just using a leftover memo. I'm just gonna use the back of this. If you have time and you wanna do this project again, go ahead and color it. Create your own coral reef, what you think a coral reef looks like. And just color it in, make it beautiful, do it however you wanna do. So we have our base, okay? We also should have two different colors of Play-Doh. Whatever colors you want, that's all good. If you don't have two colors and you have one color, that's fine as well. We just go with the flow. You also should have a rolled up, what would you call this? It's, so it's construction paper or a copy paper that's been rolled up and then cut down about to about a third of the way. And these are going to be our stinging tentacles yes all right so let's get started so i want you to take one of your play-doh or whatever modeling clay whatever you got if you folks made it that's awesome too i know it's fun to make to make play-doh so i want you to get it maybe like a golf ball size and then i want you to roll it between your palms Roll it and roll it. That also feels so awesome to roll Play-Doh between your, your palms. And I want you to get it into a nice ball. There we go. Nice ball. Okay, so this is going to be the body of our coral polyp. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get that body of your coral polyp and you're gonna place it in the center of your base. So remember our base, it's kind of that hard skeleton, right? Because we know that corals secrete this hard skeleton that protects the coral polyp body, which is a soft sac-like entity, right? So we're gonna get that coral polyp mound and we're gonna push it down with our fingers, and we are gonna firmly attach it to the rest of the coral reef, yes? So it's getting attached. And it's gonna look kind of like a mountain, kind of like a mound. We wanna firmly attach that down there because we know how important it is for the corals to live as a colony, right? They help each other out, just like an ohana. All right, so once you've got it down, firmly attached, just like our other coral polyps in the ocean, then you're going to get your tentacles. So what I want you to do with your tentacles, it's very difficult to catch zooplankton when your tentacles are all just up like this, right? 
So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to open them up. So let's start very gently bringing down your tentacles and opening them up. So go around, open up your stinging tentacles so that they can catch as much plankton as they can. So here we are, opening them up, making sure they have the best chance to catch those drifters, those plankton that are drifting in the ocean currents. Yes. And when do they come out? When do our coral polyps come out? Do you folks remember? Put it in the chat. So here they have opened up all of their tentacles. We have some of Sean saying at night, they come out at night and Janet says at sunset. Good job, right? When the sun That's goes so down at nighttime, you folks yes. are paying attention. So once we have it, the, the tentacles have been opened up. Now I want you to place it into the body of your coral polyp. So we're gonna put it in there. And now we have our coral polyp. We have the body, we have the base, and we have our tentacles, all of them working in order for this coral polyp to survive. Okay, so what else did we learn about? What was the name of the BFF? Who remembers the name of the BFF to the coral polyp? Oh boy, it's quiz time. Who remembers? Anybody remember the name of the BFF? Tua says Zozentheli. Lisa says Zo Zozentheli. Good job. You folks are paying attention. All right, so our coral polyp needs some zoosantheli or zoosantheli, yes? So let's get some. If you have a Play-Doh of a different color, I want you to go ahead and take off tiny bits, like maybe the size of your pinky fingernail, tiny little pieces. And I want you to just take a couple, just make a few, and then we're gonna place these onto our tentacles. So you're gonna take your tiny zooxanthellae and we're gonna place them on our tentacles because we need these, they provide most of the energy source for our coral polyps comes from our zooxanthellae. So go ahead and take little pieces and place them on your tentacles. And those are the BFFs that help to capture that sunlight and create photosynthesis so that our coral polyps can be healthy and strong. So go ahead and take your little pieces and place them on your coral polyps. And I'm so happy that we have schools from Lanai, from Waipahu, and any other school groups that are out there. I'm so happy that you folks have been able to join us and learn more about our coral polyp, our oldest ancestor. So how are you folks doing? How are you doing on your model? You've got your, your zooxanthellies, you've got your coral polyp, You've got the tentacles opened up to capture some plankton and other small little drifters. We've got our base, we've got our coral polyp firmly attached to either the seafloor or to other coral. All right. So it's okay if you're not done. We know we have a limited time, so I'm gonna move on a little bit and I'm gonna start presenting again. And we'll just have a few more things that we're gonna be talking about. So let me get back to the presentation. And we're gonna move on a bit. So, 
So one of the really important things I wanted to emphasize was this practice that we do here in Hawaii, and it's called Malama Aina. And I want you to read. You're not sharing your screen. Oh, okay. I know you have an awesome slide with um, with these words, with these Hawaiian words on them. I want to make sure that we can share that. Okay, let me, hold on just a second. Yep. We'll That's figure that out. Right. Yeah, because last time we had some problems with this. Let's see, are we there? Yes. Oh, perfect. Oh, nope. If we were there and now we see your desktop. How about there? Perfect. Yep, we see it. Okay, friends, here we are. So look at all those beautiful tiny coral polyps. They look just like flowers. I think they are one of the most beautiful organisms in the world. So here in Hawaii, we have a practice that we call malama aina. So I want you to repeat after me, malama. Let's do it again, malama and aina, aina. So let's put it together. Repeat after me. Malama Aina. Malama Aina. And it's a beautiful way that we, we take care of the world around us. So Malama means to care for. And Aina is that which feeds us. And if we really think about it, the world feeds us, right? The land feeds us. Safeway doesn't feed us, the land feeds us, the ocean feeds us. And so our food comes from these places, right? The natural world provides for us our food, our jobs, the beautiful natural environments that we get to take part in that have all kinds of life forms like we saw in the ocean and with the coral reefs. All of that beautiful life forms where we can go chill out, we can actually gather our food, we can do fun activities. And so we all thinking about this, if we depend on the natural world to feed us, then what are we doing to take care of that natural world? And so malama aina is that practice. And it's how we give back through our actions and the things that we do and we give back to the land and to the oceans. And really especially remembering that if this is our ancestor, right? The coral polyp, all of the life forms that have been born before us humans, these are our ancestors. So how do we treat them? How do we teach, how do we treat our kupuna, our, our grandparents, our aunties and uncles, right? So once we start looking at the world in that way, as our family, as our ohana, then we understand that we have a responsibility to make sure that we take care of our family. So I want to just really emphasize that that's a really important way to give back. And I wanna know how you all in your communities, wherever you are, how you can mala ma'aina, how you can take care of that which feeds you and your families, yeah? So just something to think about and take with you after this, uh, this presentation. So we know that corals, oh, there's, there's some things going on in the world that's causing a lot of um, effects on our corals. This is from the um, American Samoa, and I wanted you to see the healthy coral reef in December of 2014 the dying coral reef in February of 2015, and then the dead coral reef. And, and it's, you see how quickly this can happen? And I know you all know some of the effects, what are, what are the impacts, what are some of those things that are causing our corals to be stressed? And so I wanna remind us that even though it is a big global problem, we all can do something about this. We have individually, we can take action, right? And so there's some things that we can do that can help our corals to not be so stressed. 
right? We can think about what are some of those chemicals that are going into the ocean, pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers, and, and work to not let those happen. Um, what about the sunscreens that we're wearing? Do we need to wear sunscreens? Can we wear sunscreens that don't have chemicals in them that harm our coral reefs? These are things that you folks can choose to do with you and your families. We can use less water because we know that a lot of runoff that goes into the ocean is stuff that's coming from the land and it's going down and covering and smothering our coral reefs. So using less water is a good thing. We can, I know a lot of you probably do this already and that you help to make sure that the litter doesn't go from our waterways down into our oceans or even help to clean up and do um, coastal cleanups or even watershed cleanups wherever you live. I know that you all are so bright and smart and that you have wonderful ideas of how we can mala ma'aina, our coral reefs and our natural and our uh, natural world around us. And I wanna encourage you to start doing that. If you haven't already, start doing these things that, that we can do to protect and take care of our natural environments and our ancestors. So I know that you folks probably have more questions and we have some time that we can get into more questions. Yeah, so we have, let's see, we have a few questions. Um, and I think, um, let's see, well, let me, let me ask a couple questions. We've got time. So um, there was one great question. Aha, I found it. Lisa asked, can a different coral species grow on the skeleton of another? Hmm, that's a great question. And you know, I think that it's a possibility. I know that scientists have actually been um, cultivating heat resistant corals and they're out planting them into areas where um, there has been coral bleaching and coral death. And um, there's amazing work that coral scientists all over the world are doing to replenish and restock our coral reef ecosystems. And so I would love, just wanna encourage all of you, um, all of you who are watching this, that if you have an interest in this, we need people, we need smart people, we need people who care about our environment to start creating solutions. There's a lot of challenges, but we as human beings have always been very resilient. And if we use our minds, and our hearts, then we can really meet some of these challenges and start to help the natural world around us. So thank you, Mahalo, for that question. Absolutely. And I also want to say we've got some um, people who have been doing really great things. So uh, Danielle wrote that they plant uh, will, willy willy trees. And they also do beach cleanups. And Ra Rachel says that they recycle. So we're really proud of our audience for helping out. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you for the willy willy trees because they were hurt by um, invasives that came through. So willy willy trees are culturally important in Hawaii. And thank you, Diane, for the work that you are doing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, um, for chiming in. And uh, absolutely, we have a few questions left over, but um, uh, you know, please go out and, and see if you can answer the questions. And then we'll also ask Malia, um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer the questions and we'll post her answers and then you can compare your answers. Um, so thank you so much again, Malia, and thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters. Um, and please stay tuned for a post webinar survey because we would love your feedback and for information on past and upcoming upcoming webinars or to receive a NOAA Live Iron On Patch, visit our website at Woods Hole Sea Grant. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you, mahalo to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on January 18th for a special NOAA Live webinar entirely in Spanish. Thank you very much. 
and uh, have a lovely day. Aloha, ahoy